Good morning. Welcome to worship. It is good to be together. Let us begin with our call to worship. Whose story is this? This, this story, story is God's, God's alone to tell. To tell. It, it hums in the rivers and the trees. It whispers in the skies and the seas. It calls to people of all places. It speaks in our hearts, in our lives. Why then should we speak of this story? This story, this story calls our name in creation. This story claims our lives through the cross. This story shapes our future through the spirit. We are the story in this time and this place. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. of grace. You, you call, call us to, to be different, different from, from the world, but the, the world is seductive, and so we come here to be strengthened. God of vision, you hold before us an alternate way of life, different priorities, different loyalties, different values, but we know that the world is not only seductive, but powerful. And so we are drawn in to following its priorities, accepting its values, showing loyalty to its gods. God, who blesses the meek, the peacemakers, the merciful, forgive us when we lose sight of these qualities, when we misunderstand their role in the world. Dear friends, rejoice and be glad. God is gracious and God offers blessings. God calls us to life in the world. God offers us the chance to explore how to live out God's vision. We are called, we are forgiven, we are blessed. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. God of grace. You've created us with compassion and grace, with the ability to work and the need to rest. Yet we know too well that life is full of busyness and distractions. Help us to unplug and place our focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome. I'm so happy that you have tuned in to be with us wherever it is that you may be, as we're in our second week of our, set, of our first series for this year called Unplugged. And, and this week we're going to focus on kind of 
what matters in our life. So I, I got a question for you. Uh, do you ever feel like you're too busy for what really matters? Do you ever feel like you're constantly rushed, that, that, that you're burned out, frankly, by the busyness? That, that maybe for you, this is what life is, a constant treadmill. Constantly going, going, going. Now, don't get me wrong. I like to go and be on the treadmill. Actually, I need to go get on the treadmill a little more often now. But, but this is what, sometimes what our life feels like. It's just like constantly going, constantly going. You know, I like going over to the gym and working out on the treadmill. And I remember <laughs> several years back, I was at uh, the YMCA down in Wilmer. And uh, working out, I was watching television. I think I was watching something on ESPN. And uh, there was this guy, two treadmills down from where I was. Um, and, and he was kind of this guy that was always at the gym and always trying to impress people with all, what he could lift and all the ways he could just like show how, how fit he was. Um, I don't know why he felt he had to do that, but that's what he did. Well, anyway, there was... <laughs> Sadly, this young lady came and got on the treadmill in between the two of us. And now, when I say I'm on the treadmill, I want you to be very clear. I do not run on the treadmill. I do a brisk walk, but I don't do any of the running. And I don't feel like I need to do any of the running. So this young woman is working out, doing her thing. And, and of course, she's jogging along and, 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 and pushing up the the reps so she's going faster and faster. Now, what did the guy on the other side of her do? Well, he starts to try to keep up. And he keeps pressing the button, keeps pressing the button, and he keeps going, 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 and this is what happened. He went flying off of the treadmill. Flying off the treadmill. And I would be lying to you if I didn't bust out laughing. I couldn't help myself. It was just so funny that this, this desire to try to impress ended with him getting shot off the back of the treadmill. But sometimes this is how we feel with our life, right? We get so cotton picking busy that we try to speed up the treadmill to get done sooner and it never ends well, does it? It just doesn't end well. So I was thinking about this, and I thought about this what if. What if the greatest enemy to the life that we want might be the actual life that we're living right now? You ever thought about that? Maybe this crazy life that we're trying to keep up with, this crazy treadmill that we're trying to run on, and we keep pushing the button on, and we start to crash off of, what if? That's getting in the way. If we say it another way, and we think about what God would say, God would be like this. What if the greatest enemy to the life that God wants for you is the life you convinced yourself that you have to live? Again, like so many other things in our life, friends, it isn't what God wants. If we feel like our lives are out of balance, if our lives are on a treadmill that keeps getting faster and faster and faster, know this, that is not from God. God didn't wire us to be that way. God doesn't want us in that crazy, fast-paced life. As a matter of fact, God wants to slow us down. We have an example of that if we look at the life of Jesus. If you look at how Jesus lived his life. Now, Jesus' ministry spanned about three years. Jesus went out and recruited disciples. Who did he recruit? He didn't go to the best schools to get the smartest guys. He got all of the people who flunked out of rabbi school. Twelve of them, as a matter of fact. He went around the countryside over those three years. He taught. He trained. He healed the sick. He fulfilled Bible prophecies. He spent some time with sinners and outcasts. He even had time to challenge the Pharisees. But you know something? You know, there's one thing that I have not found anywhere in the Gospels about Jesus. 
Jesus never ran once. Nowhere in the gospel does it talk about Jesus running from point A to point B. He doesn't do that. It doesn't talk about him jogging. It doesn't talk about him sprinting or speed walking or doing anything like that. He accomplished all these things in three years because he was busy, but he was never rushed. He was busy, but Jesus was never rushed. Let's take a look at the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 2 says this. As Jesus walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Notice he doesn't rush up to the tax collector's booth. He doesn't say to Levi, hey, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Come on, come on, keep up, keep up. Never does Jesus say that. Jesus was busy, but Jesus wasn't rushed. So if we say we follow an unrushed Jesus, doesn't that give you and I permission? Doesn't it give us permission to live an unrushed life for ourselves? I mean, if this is who we follow, if we believe that this Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, and we do, and if we're called to live a life like his, where do we get this notion that we have to constantly be in a hurry, constantly having to rush? You know, there's a lot of different Bible translations out there. One of them is written by a man by the name of Eugene Peterson. It's called The Message. And Eugene writes this, Pastor Peterson writes the Bible in a way that's very conversational. It's very easy for somebody who's new to the faith maybe to understand. And I love how he wrote this about the Matthew 11 text. Matthew 11, beginning with verse 28, says this. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Do you hear it? Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Jesus invites us into a life that isn't rushed. Doesn't it sometimes feel like every day is going faster? Every year goes faster? Well, that's because we get ourselves so caught up in the rush of the life that we live that we oftentimes miss what is important. So it made me think about how did Jesus live? Well, if you look at Jesus' life, Jesus was commissioned when he was baptized in the Jordan. What did Jesus do after he received his commission? Did he take off right away and start collecting disciples? No, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus went on vacation. Jesus took a sabbatical. He went away into the wilderness for 40 days to focus on he his relationship with God. Now, in the wilderness, he was tempted. But Jesus went to the wilderness, away from everything else. The very first thing he does after becoming this commissioned Lord is he goes on vacation. How about his first miracle? Jesus' first miracle, remember, it wasn't healing anybody who was sick. It wasn't helping a blind man see. It wasn't anything like that. Jesus is at a wedding reception. And he's having a great time at the wedding reception. And his mother comes to him and says, they've run out of wine. What are we going to do? And Jesus says, let's turn that water into wine and let's keep the party going. Jesus wasn't in a rush to end the party. Jesus wanted everybody to still be happy and marry, and celebrate that wedding. There was a man named Jairus who came to Jesus. He came to Jesus with an urgent plea. His young daughter was home, and she was on the brink of death. 
And he asked Jesus, would you, would you come with me? Would you come and heal my daughter and, and save her from death? And Jesus agrees. But he doesn't run back. Jesus walks to Jairus' home. And then along the way, a woman stops Jesus and is healed by Jesus. What happened to the little girl? Well, by the time Jesus gets there, the little girl has died. Except Jesus knows it's not a permanent death. Jesus, very calmly, walks into the room, touches the little girl and says these words, Talitha kumi, little girl, arise. You see, Jesus isn't about being rushed. If Jesus wasn't rushed in his soul, then friends, we have to ask ourselves the question, why are we? Why do we feel this pressure to go, go, go all the time? You know, I think most of us are rushing to or running from something or to something in our life. We're running from a lack of significance to trying to find something that makes significance. Some of us, frankly, have to run from abuse to safety. And, and in those cases, we do have to run. Sometimes we run towards success or being popular. We want to be liked. We want to be liked so desperately, we will do anything and everything to get it. What's the problem? Well, the problem is this. If that's what we're doing, then the greatest enemy to our, our life, to the life that we want, is really the life that we're living. It's not giving us what we want. I started thinking about what do we do with our time? What do we do with our time? Well, I found this rather interesting. The average person spends 706 hours a year on social media. And if you're a young person, you're an overachiever. You'll go even more than that. Okay? Television. On average, a person spends 2,737 hours per year sitting in front of a television. And video games, oh, you don't want to hear it. Especially if you're a guy. Guys, guess what? By the time we turn age 21, the average guy will have spent 10,000 hours playing video games. Now, what could we do with those 10,000 hours? Well, we could have read 2,000 books if we would, would have applied ourselves that way. You could have got your pilot's license with, two, with those 10,000 hours. Apply yourself to school, you could have got your graduate and your undergraduate and your graduate degree by applying yourself for those 10,000 hours. But for all of us, when we don't put our priority where it should be, what lacks, what is harmed when we don't apply the time? Well, our marriages start to suffer. We could have applied ourselves to make our marriage stronger instead of playing a video game or, or watching TV or sitting on Snapchat and Facebook and TikTok. We could reconcile a broken relationship with a family member. We could have helped someone and built a better relationship with our family instead of, of sitting on the sideline and mindlessly wasting our time. You see, that's the thing, isn't it? We're chasing a life that, frankly, won't give us what we're looking for, if that's what we're doing. So, what does that mean? If this is the truth, what if the greatest enemy to the life you want to be is the life that you're living? What does that mean? What do I do? Well, if you don't slow down, friends, you're eventually going to be forced to slow down. Because God didn't create you to always be on the go. Remember what we heard last week? God created us with some sense of limits so that we don't overdo it. So 
How do we do it? How do we figure out how to put the main thing back in our life? To start to, be, to stop being so busy that we're missing out on what really matters in our life. What do we do? Well, God says we are to apply ourselves to something very simple. It's to love. Love is at the core of everything that God calls us to be. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians we hear this. Or, or in this book, I just want to tell you about this book. This is a great book. If you get a chance, look this up. John Mark Comer wrote this book, The Ruthless Elimination of Furry. What a great name, right? But in his book, this is what he writes. Love is incompatible with furry. I want to say it to you again. Love is incompatible with hurry. Now remember what Jesus did. He didn't hurry, but he did teach us to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. This is what love means. And this is what's going to help us unplug ourselves and refocus ourselves to what really matters. I want to give you a little something to help you this week with that. I want you to remember that love takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not in a hurry, right? This is a Jesus thing, so we're going to walk with it. We're going to spend some time with it. It's not in a hurry. Love takes time. So I want you to get up this week. I want you to get up this week with this prayer. And it goes like this. God, help me. Walk slowly enough to experience Jesus fully and to love people deeply. Because ultimately, friends, the answer for us is not more time. The answer for us is making room for what really matters. So let's do this again. Say it with me. God help me. Walk slowly enough to experience Jesus fully and love people deeply. Close your eyes. Let me say to you one more time. Friend, God help you walk slowly enough to experience Jesus fully and love people deeply. Make time for what really matters. Amen. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be sweet and beautiful for Thee. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from me. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it fine, it 
it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let us confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator, creator of, heaven of heaven and earth. I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended, descended to the dead. On the, On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Eternal God, we pray for the land, people, and animals affected by global warming. We pray especially for those who have been in the paths of storms, fires, floods, or droughts. Help us and all leaders to see what needs to be done to change this pattern so that we and future generations may live happy and health healthy lives on this earth. Lord, in your, in your mercy, mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Faithful God, we live in a busy world and we are sometimes so busy. Families are often torn between activities and being involved in your house of worship. Help us to see our need for you in our lives and help us to make priorities and choices that are good and healthy for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear. hear our prayer. Dear God, we pray for our outdoor worship and picnic today to be meaningful, meaningful and welcoming. May we all be touched by your word and our hospitality. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving God, we pray for all who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, the hospitalized and homebound, the homeless and hungry, as well as those who are experiencing anxiety, depression, or special needs. Dear God, there are so many needs, way too many to mention, so we lay our cares and our concerns before you now, silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. And dear Lord, we pray for those who are experiencing grief, the Hiltner family, the Alter family, the Super family, and all those who are experiencing any kind of losses, Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
with the joy and the love of the Lord we are called to be light for the kingdom, to live in the freedom of the city of God. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. Dear friends, have a wonderful week, and remember that you are called to be the church wherever you may be. So go in love and peace to serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.